just as a highlight, let me give you guys kind of our rundown for today. If you've been following some of my shorts and videos through the week, you uh, already know some of the hot topics, but it's just so hard to cover like the depth of what's going on in a 30 second or a 60 second reel, right? So those are really the highlights, call them teasers to get you up uh, to Friday so that you guys get the full scoop. But uh, let me give you the three topics that we're going to be covering today. And then I'm going to do something unique also today, and I'll be taking questions in our comments section on my Zoom webinar. So for those of you who are actually live participants uh, in my uh, Zoom webinar, I will be taking questions and comments from there. Uh, not, not so much the raise hand thing, but you guys can do the chat section. So if we're going over something and you have a question, it's unresolved. By each section, I will uh, chip over and go to the questions to see if there's anything that I can help you guys with. But here are the topics. Number one, the auto market. And the reason I chose this is one, it impacts all of us, right? I can't imagine uh, any of you who are on this that don't have some means of transportation or don't rely on some means of transportation in your daily life. And so this uh, first segment is really going to be a, about uh, and for people who are either trying to sell a vehicle or looking to purchase a vehicle within the next 12 months. Uh, I've got some really great data on this that uh, timing is going to be everything. And just to kind of give you a a tip into what we're going to go into right now is not the best time to be buying a car. Uh, the second thing that we're going to be going over is the commercial real estate crash uh, and some of the progress, I guess you could say, or further uh, indicators that I'm seeing that are showing we're just getting started uh, in some of the uh, commercial or CRE impact that's going to impact these regional banks uh, it's going to impact possibly the residential real estate side, but no question it's going to affect lending and as a whole. And so everyone in the country is going to be impacted by commercial real estate. I can't stand it when people get on <clears throat> and they pretend that the commercial real estate is this sheltered bubble that if, if and when it, well, no, it's just a matter of when. When it pops, it's not going to have rippling effects in the other markets and in your daily life. It just will. And so I want to make sure that you guys are prepared for this because it's massive. The massive pileup and bubble that we created in commercial real estate is worse than 2000. Is Hear, hear it this way. It's worse than 2008. Uh, and there are some things about it that I think are better, like in, in terms of like total market and recession. But uh, as a whole, the CRE market is, uh, it's toast. And me, there are analysts who are saying, and I know we'll get into this, but there are analysts who are saying that it may not even come back and recover until 2040. 2040, guys, that's over 20 or about 20 years uh, from right now. And so like, this, this data is shocking. The last piece of data we're going to go over uh, is income. So corporate earnings. And this, I have to talk about this because the way that companies are geared to talk about it, the way the news is geared to talk about it, you hop on and you think, oh, everything's great. And, and sure enough, you hop on the VIX and look at the VIX indicator right now. Uh, and it's at like an all-time low. So there's tons of complacency in the market and corporate earnings are are awful. Uh, I don't get it. I don't get how we've piled all back into the S&P 500. We're at almost an all-time high again. And corporate earnings are coming in and projections are coming in. Uh, second to worst since 2020 when the COVID crash happened. Second to worst. So anyways, I'll show you those charts. Those are our topics today. Uh, auto, so the car market, two, commercial real estate market, and then three, corporate earnings reports, what to make of this, because this is going to impact all stocks. It will impact all major indexes, ETFs. Basically, if you have your money in anything, uh, corporate earnings and what's about to come out, the reality that's going to hit the news probably two to three weeks from now, uh, is it's going to impact everything. And so this this will be good uh, information to take in and then do a little bit of your own homework if you're deciding to rebalance or restructure how your investment uh, uh, or investments are going forward 
into 2024, maybe even into 2025. So we'll talk about that. I'll give you some things that I would be looking at, but let's go ahead and jump right in. And we're going to talk first about this auto market. Um, where should I start with this? So June, June 2023, we saw an average new car transaction price of 27% compared to three years ago. So we've seen a price increase in uh, the average new car transaction up 27% from the pandemic. So that seems really great, right? Car prices are up. Uh, a lot of people would say that this is not a function of uh, more profit, but a function also of inflation, which I would agree, where the current average transaction prices are below the manufacturer's suggested retail price today. So current average transactions, so we have this prices are 27% over a year ago, you know, from the pandemic, but now average transactions are all priced below the manufactured uh, suggested retail price, which was not happening during, you know, the peak of the pandemic. Like people were paying sticker price for the cars, which frankly, guys, I know we forget, but when's the last time anyone paid sticker price for a car, right? So this is a, a data point that I think is important to know. Let me let me bring up a chart really quick that I think will help shed some light on this. And this is a, this is June. So this is last month's, obviously we're waiting for July and July is always going to be a shocker. And this should be peak, by the way, we should be seeing peak sales going into like the spring and summer months. Typically sales drop off. We do see a little spike during uh, winters, like the, the end of year. But outside of that, this is typically the hot time in the market. Same with like traditional real estate. But you can see this is June's average transaction price. So this is taking all of the cars and averaging their actual price. And what you're seeing here, and I have some data on this also. Yeah, here's the data point. So what this is showing is average, not luxury. So luxury transaction prices for June were $63,977, where the average is $45,291. And so you can see uh, between those two, like luxury and average, and uh, average transaction, which actually has dropped from peak. Peak was around 50 uh, to the beginning of this year. So the market has already come down. And so a lot of people are going, oh, well, that's as low as it's going to go. You know, obviously, if you're in the industry or you're a car dealer or a used car dealer, you're probably smoking your own stuff thinking, oh, yeah, this is the bottom. Everything's going to get better. Uh, but the data shows otherwise, guys, and it's staggering. So what I would say is if you're someone who's looking to buy a car right now, the data I'm showing you likely is going to have you think to wait. In fact, I would say from the data I pulled in and some of the stuff I, I'm going to show you, I would say I wouldn't buy a car right now until end of this year, maybe beginning of next. So if you can wait, you know, get that alternator changed or like, you know, just change out the tires to wait. I think the savings will be significant and the deals will be much higher, especially in the used car market. One of the data points also, if you're looking for an electric car, electric car prices have seen a drop in 20% compared to last year. So right now, uh, electric cars are really great. And like I've already said, I think it's going to get better towards in the year. And I have some data on this. So here's some other uh, facts that I think are worth considering. Manufacturing incentives have risen to their highest level in the year, uh, close to $2,000. So if you're looking to buy a new car, there's already more incentives coming from the manufacturer. I think those are going to continue to go up towards the end of the year, beginning of next. And here's some reasons why. Inventory. Supply and demand is the major factor when it comes to pricing. It also affects inflation and deflationary uh, uh, like pulls on the market. And so infl uh, inventory right now is going into an all-time high. In fact, here, here are some of the data points. So in inventory availability, manufacturer incentives, dealer discounts, trade and vehicle values have faced significant disruptions over the past year affecting car prices. But inventory levels 
have risen 75% from a year ago. 70, that's right, 75%. So if you don't think that prices are going to come down, like just imagine you've got a car lot, right? And you have 100 cars. Well, now you have 175, right? You've got a 75% increase from a year ago. And if you're the guy trying to sell cars and you've got 75 more cars on your lot, do you think you're not going to be offering some deals? Absolutely. And new cars were overbuilt also this year, like just ma massively overbuilt. And there's just a surplus of them, including electric vehicles. Let me show you guys this chart on supply. So I'm not just making this stuff up, right? And I know you guys know this, but here's the chart on days of supply. And this is June's last report, right? And these are the different types of cars. And so it, I think it's important to note also what type of car you're interested in. So if you're someone who's like wanting a Toyota right now, a Honda, a Kia, a Lexus, those guys were smart. They did not overbuild. They did not over manufacture. And I don't know what who who's running the show over there or if the demand's higher because the price is lower, but those guys really have things figured out. You go into some of these like kind of sideways uh, what would I call them? Like off-brand luxury, maybe like Jaguar, for example, like they have over 130 days supply of cars. That's, that's insane. Lincoln has 110, uh, uh, infinity has a hundred, almost a hundred. So you can almost look at the chart from highest to lowest and where you're going to get the best deals from, from a new car is going to be Jaguar first, Lincoln, then infinity. And if, frankly, if they're not doing that, then their inventory of supply is just going to get larger. So you can almost look at this chart from left to right and go, where am I going to get the best incentives this year for a car? Well, it's not going to be Toyota, Honda. So if you're looking to buy a Toyota or a Honda, should you wait? I still think yes. But the deals are going to be much greater. And when I say much greater, like insane deals, like massive discounts off MSRP, massive interest rate discounts. I mean, uh, car dealerships are going to be doing everything they can to get rid of these cars because they can't afford to hold them into next year. And where you're going to get the best deals are going to be on the right side. It's going to be Jaguar, Lincoln, Infiniti, Buick, Ram, Chrysler, Dodge, Audi, Mini, Jeep, Ford, in that order. And so everything that's on the left side, Toyota, Honda, Kia, Lexus, BMW, Subaru, they're going to have less discounts. Whoever's running the show over there, kudos to their CEOs and CFOs and you know whoever's whoever's planning out how much they manufacture. They nailed it. You know they've done a much better job creating the supply of their vehicles. Where these guys on the right obviously did not, and they're going to pay the price. So good news if you're trying to buy. Bad news if you're trying to sell. If you need to make a swap in cars, like you, you know, a trade-in or whatever, I still think your deals are going to be better by the end of the year. But it's kind of a zero net sum market at that point. And what I mean by that, it's like real estate, other than interest rates. Here, here's what I mean. Uh, obviously, beginning of next year, we'll probably be done with our last rate hike, so you're not going to have much of a higher interest uh, payment if you're making payments on this car. But if you're trading a car in for a new car, I mean, you're kind of going to, you're going to lose on the trade in, but you're going to make up for it on the new end side. So it's like kind of a wash that way. Uh, however, I think end of this year, you're going to get way better deals beginning next way better deals. And we're, I, I've even seen car dealerships right now that are offering 4% 3% interest rates internally because they're trying to get these cars off the shelf. Uh, so yeah, anyways, there's the full picture on the, the car market. If you guys have any questions, thoughts, or comments, I'd love to hear what you guys have. Here's some additional bullet points to consider, and then we're going to move to commercial real estate. One of the things that I, I thought was uh, a, a good data point to just bring out is that vehicle incentives are back uh, with car makers spending about 4.2% of the average transaction to make a deal. 
And I think that number will likely double. So prediction for Matt, obviously, this isn't financial advice, but my prediction is that that four will go to eight sometime between now and the beginning of next year. So watch for incentives. If you're buying a car end of this year, we're going to see, I think the incentives will get crazy towards the end of the year because they're going to be trying to get rid of last or this year's inventory. Higher trade-in values due to the shortage of used vehicles are offering an excellent opportunity for consumers to swing the cars. But that's changing. Used car lots are starting to pile up. But the used car market is hotter than the new car market. And so that trade in value option right now isn't necessarily bad, but it's not going to get worse. OK, uh, one of the other things that I thought was interesting that we pointed out is certain vehicle prices have begun to drop. But just like we saw in that chart, because of supply and demand, guess who's not dropping their prices as much? Honda, Toyota, Kia, right? The ones that were on the left side. And so they're still high because of supply. And frankly, they're typically priced better in the market. So I, that might have something to do with the supply. Also, people probably aren't buying luxury vehicles when uh, otherwise in the last couple of years they would. So looking ahead, trends indicate that vehicle supplies will continue to improve. But despite not being able to predict the price, popular cars will drop. Expert uh, advice shoppers remain flexible. So the experts are saying prices are going to continue to drop. Uh, I'm seeing that inventory levels are going to get, continue to rise. And frankly, if you're a buyer, that's good news for you. All right. So let's move in to our next piece on this, the commercial real estate. So this is, this is where I have to like take a little breather because I don't feel like the news and the people who have impact in this market, well, that's not true. I think the feds, I'm going to say something maybe controversial, but the feds and Jerome Powell, I know he's gotten a lot of crap uh, on like interest rates and how to fix the economy, things he should have done, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think he's done a phenomenal job. In fact, I, th I think he's done his job. And this year has shown that uh, the certain constraints that they put into the market has constricted M2 money supply. And because of that, inflation is starting to come down. Now, is it where we want it to be? No, it needs to be at 2%. And so we're going to still see rate hikes or a lengthened period of high interest rates until that inflation starts to drop. Because of interest rates, let me give you the, the commercial. For those of you new or for those of you who don't understand what's going on in commercial real estate, let me paint a picture for you. And what has happened in commercial real estate is we have this issue with interest rates where people, uh, specifically investors, were going in, teaming up and buying commercial real estate. In fact, in fact, BlackRock was one of the biggest players in this. They were going in and buying billions of dollars in commercial real estate, and they were doing it with investors' money. Well, it's not dollar for dollar. When an investor comes in and raises a bunch of capital to invest in the real estate market, Let's say they raise $100 million. Well, they don't buy $100 million in property. They buy $500 million, maybe $800 million in property. How do they do that? Well, they go to regional banks, like your credit union that's down the street, your, your central bank that's issuing stuff, You know, not, not your JP Morgans, not your, your big banks, but it typically will go to some regional bank and they'll say, hey, We'll put 10% down or whatever, you know, based on fair market value. Here's the rents that are coming in. This justifies the loan. Everything will be fine. And they'll they'll leverage their, their real estate options, right? So they go in with, you know, instead of, let's say they're buying a hundred million dollar property, they'll come in with only 10 to 20 million to secure the property. And then they'll have their interest rate payments, right? And so let's just say for the sake of, of making things simple, Let's say they buy X property and on last two years rates at all time lows, they were at like, you know, for some of the some of the commercial rates I was getting it was between four and five percent, like low, like best case scenario. Well, what most people don't know, because the residential side is so different, commercial real estate changes their rates every three to five years. In fact, that's typically the longest you can go out is locking in like a five-year rate. Banks just won't do it. They won't lock in a 10, 15, 
30 year mortgage on these insanely large commercial properties. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense. And the way that they buy bonds and then issue short term debt, it doesn't, it really doesn't make sense that we're doing things like this, but it makes it more appealing often. It makes the rate uh, and the, the project uh, more profitable. But then when inflation happens and interest rates rise like they have been, now a rate, in fact, we just uh, renewed, so we, we just renewed and refinanced one of my uh, conglomerate properties. And we had a rate hike of, I think, almost 2%. I think we went from like four and three quarters to six and a quarter, something like that. So not exactly two points or 2%. But this is what's happening in the industry is they're going from now, and now, by the way, it's like seven and a half percent. It's in upwards 8% for some of these commercial loans. Their interest rate is double. So what happens to their monthly payment? It does the same thing. And so now these commercial buildings, you've got two problems. One, your payment this year. And by the way, here's one of the facts on here that one of the first things I want to talk about. There's almost $1.5 trillion in U.S. commercial real estate debt that's coming due for repayment before the end of 2025. $1.5 trillion. Now you take $1.5 trillion that all have in same rates because everyone refinanced. Trust me, like I did. And everyone I know did. They didn't keep their high rates from five years ago. And they were forced to renew, right? As the market like started to influx every three to five years, like we talked about. Well, guess what? Those are coming up for renewal. 1.5 trillion, in fact, before the end of 2025. And what are their rates going to be at? Well, we've got two more rate hikes coming. So we're talking eight, maybe eight and a half percent. And to make matters worse, what's happened? Uh, you guys, you guys know this. What's happened is the commercial real estate uh, market, because of COVID, has abandoned commercial real estate. We the butts and seats required at a workplace has dramatically dropped. Yes, granted, it is coming back. I've noticed that even in the tech sector, people are calling their workforces back into butts and seats. I get that. But the demand will never be the same as it was pre-COVID. People have figured out they don't have to do everything uh, from an office and a lot of work can go remote. So you combine the two, you combine increased rates and a drop in demand for these buildings. These, you know, the, the amount of butts and seats we need has dropped because people are willing to work from home and we've kind of figured it out with all this tech. And that's what's created the bubble. So commercial real estate market is predicted to crash. And this is not like like some uh, analysis that I'm like making this stuff this stuff up, and it's like you know I'm I'm projecting a, like a percentage, like it's it's like a hundred percent, like it's one hundred percent in my mind that we're going to see a real estate crash. It, there's just no way to not have that happen. It's like the car market we just talked about when you increase supply. There's only one thing that can happen, and that's prices have to drop. And there are experts who are saying that uh, they could take till 2040 with inflation and, and possible growth in our economy to even catch back up to those prices. So here's some of the data points. Here's some of the things that I thought you guys would find are fascinating. Uh, but let me jump into this. I think you'll like this. Okay, so one of the data points that I thought was interesting, Federal Reserve initiated inflation fighting rate hikes, increasing cost of loans, further straining commercial real estate. The office space vacancy hit a record high in, this is this year, of 12.9%. So overall, record high of 12.9% in Q1 of 2023, with predictions of late 2023 recession further intensifying fears. So that's that's actually a third factor I didn't even think to consider to add into this. One, you got interest rates on the climb. Two, you have this new world we're living in where people don't need as many butts and seats at work. And then three, the potential recession that's coming. And I don't know, this isn't something I'm going to say with a surety, like I know about the commercial real estate, but it's very likely we're going into a recession. Some people would say we're already in a recession due to stagflation, 
And just the inflation is kind of covering it up. But you take those three factors now, and it's like, this bubble is going to pop even harder if we go into a hard recession, which my personal opinion, not trade advice, is that's where we're going into late this year, early next. So despite these negative trends, commercial real estate values are more likely to experience a long side, uh, like long, yeah, this kind of long slide movement uh, more than just like a, like it's not going to be an all out crash, but what you have to consider is what's it going to impact? Like it, as an average day consumer, how does this affect me? And I I heard this ridiculous interview that Barbara Corcoran uh, did where she, she owns a bunch of commercial real estate, right? And she owns a, a ton of residential, like apartment complexes and so forth. One of the richest ladies actually in the US and most of her wealth has come from uh, real estate. She got on the news and she said this thing that, oh no, the commercial real estate and residential markets are not connected. Yes, we have a commercial real estate problem, but I think that's going to fix itself. But the residential market's coming back. Well, if you're on my last week's podcast, you know, that's not true. The residential market, one, has not come back. We're still below the all-time high from last year. And two, the commercial real estate absolutely is going to impact the residential. And here's why. Here's the, the data behind this that I think most people miss. If commercial lending gets hit hard, and by the way, let me look at, let me find the data on this. There's a certain percentage, small banks. Oh, yeah, yeah. So small and mid-sized banks hold 67.2% of all outstanding commercial real estate loans, which this is going to play a significant role in how things play out. So if your community bank that's in, that you likely have an account with, like I really want you guys to think this through. But if your community bank that has 62 or 67, excuse me, 67 plus percent of all the outstanding commercial real estate, it's not JP Morgan. It's like most of these regional banks. Well, if they own most of this, and some of them, by the way, are leveraged over 20%, like over 20% of their holdings is in this commercial real estate stuff. If you owned the bank, and you were out in San Francisco, and I know some of you guys saw my shorts this week, and you owned, you financed that mall that was 552, I think, million dollars that the owner just gave it back this last week. Just said, no, nope, you know that $500 million mall we just bought? We can't afford to make payments on this. It's obviously not working out. Bank, we're sorry. If you're the bank, what would you do? Do you think... When your next customer comes in and they're like, hey, I really need this house loan, you don't think that you're going to be you're, like, you're going to sharpen your pencil a little bit more than you were. You don't think when you give that next auto loan, you're going to sharpen your pencil a little bit more. Of course you are. You're going to require credit scores to be higher. Your amount of lending, you're probably going to drop. Why? Because real estate, these commercial loans are starting to get handed back. We call it foreclosure. They're starting to get handed back to these banks and the banks are going, whoa, is this the beginning of something bigger? And I don't even own a bank and I know this stuff. You don't think the people who own these banks are going through this data and looking at their commercial real estate holdings going, how much of a hit can we actually take? And either way, when they meet with their boards, they're all saying, and I know some of these guys, by the way, this isn't just like hearsay. This is stuff I'm hearing from bankers. They're saying, we've got to tighten stuff up just in case. So to say that the commercial real estate crash isn't going to affect residential, that is insane. People are going to be struggling to get loans. People who normally could qualify with the same job, the same income, even, even maybe even more income to qualify for the higher rate, there will be less people that are going to be getting those loans. Why? Because the banks are not going to be lending. They are feeling a constriction. So this is something I'm watching really close, guys. I would recommend you guys keep an eye on this also. Um, one of the, let me let me bring up some of the, the highlights or better things to keep in mind also. So this, it's like, you know, I come in, I talk, I don't want to call it doom and gloom, but I talk about these things as if, you know, they're, they're immediate, they're coming, you need to pay attention. But this also isn't the end of the world. And here's some, some facts to consider about the commercial real estate that might put you at ease a little, 
but it still doesn't change the problem. It still doesn't change how they're going to react. So one of the things that I saw is the Federal Reserve did a annual stress test and they do this because, you know, they're trying to regulate rates. You know, if they bring the rates down, that will help ease things in this market. And they're just not seeing that is necessary yet. Uh, and here's one of the stress tests that they did. They did a stress test that showed that all 23 participating banks could withstand a severe re recession, despite some of them holding up to 20% of commercial real estate. So they actually did this and combined it with a recession. So they, they did all the things that we were talking about, all the concerns that I had about the market. And they combined a recession in it. And among the 23 participating banks showed that all of them could handle it. So I'm not worried about the banks not being able to fulfill. I think banks are smart, generally speaking. Here's the black swan, is peep, is, it's people. It's what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank, I actually believe could have withstand or with, uh, they could have uh, outweathered the crunch that they were having on some of the, I mean, they're heavy tech, so I get this, but there was a lot of their commercial stuff also that was kind of putting pressure on the bank. But even, even uh, Silicon Valley Bank, I think could have withstand kind of the storm. But what happened was one, person heard about their, you know, holdings or like a possible freeze of accounts, they let their other friend know. And the next thing that happened is we had a run on the bank. And that is probably the largest risk that this industry uh, faces is more of the sentiment that we have towards banks. And I can tell you that's not getting better. I can tell you as I talk to individuals and, you know, people like yourself, as you're watching your bank and even putting your money in your own bank, you probably feel less safe having it there than you ever have, even though we're more complacent about the market prices right now. What happens when we go into a recession, market prices start to drop off a cliff, which they, it's just what happens. Everything retraces. You can't always go up. What happens when that happens and we start getting this news that there's more foreclosures happening in the commercial real estate. How many more runs on the bank will there be? And under a stress test, everything looks great from the Federal Reserve perspective, but what they're not counting on is people literally just pulling cash out and sitting on it, literally putting it underneath their mattress. And that was one of the largest factors that played into the 2008 recession is cash was out there but it was literally underneath people's mattresses, like literally. Like I remember friends and family that literally took cash out and was like holding it under their mattress because they didn't trust the banks anymore. That has massive impact. And I know like we all feel like we're towing the line, right? Like, it, but the, the reality is if everyone's sentiment changes and we don't trust banks anymore, we don't trust our currency anymore or whatever happens, the market, we don't trust the market and people get scared. Even if one to 2% of the population pulls out, it will cause a chain reaction that could put a lot of stress on banks because banks, guys, this whole thing works because your money's in the bank. That's, that's how this whole system works. They're lending and getting extra dollars to lend because of the amount of money that they're holding that's yours sitting in the bank. So you start pulling money out, that's going to start affecting things. Uh, let's let's move on. So we're getting close to the end of this. Corporate earnings is my hottest topic. This is the one that, like, if you've got money in the market, if you have money in the S and P five hundred, you have money in any stock, you have money in any type of security. Uh, corporate earnings are it, right? Because at the end of the day, if GDP uh, isn't keeping up with growth of stocks, growth in prices, then we're getting what's called overvalued, where the sentiment is over. In fact, let me, I wasn't planning on doing this, but let me show you guys, just because I like you guys so much, but I want to show you guys one of the charts that I go to all the time. And it's called, I don't know how many of you guys have heard of the Warren Buffett indicator. But the reason I value this so much, and the market's kind of changing off of this, but one of the reasons I value the Warren Buffett indicator is it's a value indicator, which 
frankly, guys, at the end of the day, what you're getting with a stock has to be value. Even if it still doesn't have returns or dividends, at some point, they have to do that. At some point, we're all speculating that there's going to be a dividend, that this, there's actually going to be some type of value that we're getting for owning this stock. Okay, And if corporate earnings are dropping, that is ultimately the value. You can't it just makes no sense for how much a company's earning and the stock price to go up to be inverse. It just doesn't work that way, right? Unless they have something that we're all speculating on going, oh, they've got this AI thing that's going to change the world and make them four times as much money, but this quarter isn't as good. So you might be speculating a little bit and think the value is going to go up, meaning that the return or corporate earnings is going to be going up. Well, we've been doing this game. We've been uh speculating we've been projecting that earnings are going to come up that all this new tech and cutbacks is going to increase earnings and the news is playing this up like it's amazing like the market's amazing above expectation that's the headlines right now above expectation above expectation xyz stock above expectation well that that idea is a lie uh it's it's not a great model to be making investments based off expectations. Because if I set my expect, in fact, I'm gonna give you an analogy in a minute, but if I set my expectations really low and then supersede it, even if my quarter to quarter is getting worse, that's not better, right? If I'm making less money every quarter, but I set my expectations for the next quarter really low and then outperform it, it's like, guys, this is like, like a magic trick our CFOs are doing when they're reporting their projections because they're trying to keep their, it's really a way to try to keep their stock price high when in reality, things are just getting worse. So let me bring this up. This is the Buffett indicator. Any of you guys, by the way, can go to this site. I come here pretty often just to check it at least quarterly. Uh, what the Buffett indicator is, is I'll just read it actually. So the overview, the Buffett indicator is the ratio of the United States stock market to GDP. So what they do is they take uh, the full Wilshire and they compare it to GDP. And what that does is it allows you to take, okay, here's all the cash that's in the market. And here's actually the gross domestic product that the U.S. is putting out. And then what you can do is compare the two. And where the ratio is, we'll have you see like, oh, we are putting way too much cash and value into the stock market based on the output that we're getting. And so you can get a sense of the market. Is the market cooked or what we call overbought or is it oversold? And when do you want to buy, guys? Just basic market 101. You want to sell when things are overbought generally, and you want to buy when things are oversold. Now, this is a generalization. This is taking the average of every stock out there, right? Where if you you can actually do this and find individual stocks that are undervalued right now. Something happened, there's some scare, it's undervalued, there might be you know some large potential upside. So this is this is a massive average. This is not this does not have to do with your individual stock that you own, okay? Uh, but they kind of play into each other. So right now, aggregate U.S. market is 48 trillion. Annualized GDP is 26.7. So what the Buffett indicator does, it's just really simple math, takes the average U.S. market value, divides it by GDP, and it gives us a percentage. In this case today, it's 180%. Why does this matter? Well, when you look at the chart, it helps you see and understand it. So Historically, all the way to the 1950s, you can see the timelines and different events even that happened when we had peaks and troughs in the Warren Buffett indicator. So obviously the best times to buy were during like the 80s, early 90s, should have sold right around the 2000s. Then we had the 2000.com crash. We got down into below zero, which would have been a good time to buy back in. Then we had the 2008 crash, would have been another great time to buy back in. And right now, after COVID, we had an all-time high. We've come off of that high. And what year is that? That was mid-2022. And then 2023, it's like everyone's complacent again. We're dumping cash back into the stock market. And it is 
entering this strongly overvalued section again. Now, all this means is that there's a likely shift that's going to happen. One of two things has to happen for this to come back down to zero and for it to be at a time that you would want to put a ton of money back into securities, right? And here's what it looks like. You either have to have GDP go way up. So GDP would bring this value down, which is gross domestic product, which would mean that the earnings, which we're about to go over, right? Corporate earnings has gone way up. And if corporate earnings goes way up, then this actually comes back down and gets closer to zero. Or the stock market just comes way down in price. What's been actually happening in the stock market? It's been almost going back to all-time highs. And so it's like, we have to have one of two things happen. The stock market price either has to come way down or GDP has to go way up. That's it. That's what fixes this and creates an opportunity for investors to get back in and to buy at a good price, at a, a uh, undervalued price. And it's just like anything, guys. When you're buying a car, when you're buying and selling a goods and service, you try to buy things that are undervalued and then you want to try to sell them for something overvalued, right? I mean, that's, that's a huge win for you if you can do that. Well, let's go to this chart here. I'm going to talk about corporate earnings. This is not a fun conversation, but one that I think is necessary for our viewers and the public to understand. Here is corporate earnings, and this is Q2. So Q2, this gets us caught up, right? Uh, we're only a couple of weeks after this, but here, here's Q2's data. And you can see the different sectors of growth and the different sectors of decline. So this takes into account uh, the consumer, uh, consumer services, real estate, industrials, financial sector, uh, consumer staples, utilities, the info technology sector, S&P 500, healthcare, materials, and energy. This gives you an idea of like what's happened in this quarter. Well, you can see today's price versus June 30th. So this gives us the quarterly versus today. You can see everything has gone up. So you can see that uh, earnings growth for consumer, uh, this is like consumer products. Uh, a lot of this is inflationary by the way, but general consumer products has gone up uh, about 25%, where consumer services has only come up like 12, real estate, industrial financials, pretty slow growth, and then lots of negative growth in energy, materials, which is like building costs, lumber, cement. By the way, great if you're considering buying a home. We can do that on another podcast. Uh, healthcare, the S&P 500 growth as a whole has been dropping. And this one is particularly of interest, and that's the S&P 500. Because if we go to this chart here, I think it's this one, yes? Yeah. This one gives us that breakout of this chart. So let me show you guys this. Here's the S&P 500 that uh, was one of those sectors, right? We saw all the positive ones, a lot of consumer stuff, uh, some staples, but S&P 500 was actually in the negative and energy was in the toilet, right? Energy earnings is just garbage right now. But S&P 500 earnings growth, end of quarter estimate versus actual. So this is estimates versus actual, and you can see where estimates came in, uh, actual came in in the dark, and some of these were really great. Like you can see earnings growth when uh, Q2 of 21 came in, it was like this big surprise, but look where we're at now. So the projection of end of quarter is point or is negative 7%. Now here's what the headlines are saying. Headlines are saying, we estimates and projections, or uh, what, what's the term that they like to use? There's a couple different terms. Uh, expectations. They use expectations and surprise. So these are like the two terms you're going to hear a lot uh, in this earnings and earnings reports. So it's like, well, my expectation was this, 
but it actually came in here. And so things are amazing. And the news is going, yay, celebrate, throw your money back into the stock market. And I would call this a rug pull. And I'm going to give you guys an analogy that I used earlier this week, but I'm going to play this out to help you understand this. So expectations, and let me just pull this off for a moment so you can be with me. But it's like basketball, you know, and I'm a huge uh, NBA fan. And, and I don't mean like I watch every game. I watch the Jazz. I live here in Utah. Utah Jazz is obviously my, my team. Me and my business partner have seats in the lower bowl. So we love to go. And frankly, you know, the Jazz, they're not what they used to be. You know, they're not. They're, it's not the Stockton and Malone days, if you know what I mean. So the Jazz aren't doing that great. But let's just say that the Jazz created an expectation, right? Like, let's say that the owner came out or someone who works for the Jazz came out and said, look, we, ex you know, we know that the team's not doing that well. We've got this, you know, all these new draft picks, by the way, this is all true. And so we expect to win 13 games this season. Well, last year, and I'm just making this up, but let's say last year they won 40, which wasn't enough to get them into the playoffs, but they won 40 games and this year, because of all the changes and the new drafts, and we got rid of a lot of our best players, someone came in and they say, you know what, we expect to only win 13. Well, let's say the season happens, 2023 into 24 happens, and they win 30 games. Well, the news and the jazz and anyone marketing tickets, what are they going to say? What, what are the marketing pieces going to look like? Jazz far exceed expectations. One of the, the highest, you know, they, they improved the, the highest improved NBA team in the country. And it's like, what? Like, are you, is this, is this crazy? We just went from 40 wins to 30, right? You got to remember the facts. But what is the news, the headlines, the people who are interested in propping up their own game? What is the language they're using? To, to pull kind of do a rug pull on you. It's expectations. And it's like, okay, yeah, so your expectations went up by almost 20 games. Like, yeah, that is phenomenal. But what if setting the expectation was the rug pull? What if corporations, what if CEOs, what if these guys who understand how to manipulate their stock price all came in with really low expectations? lower than they actually believed even. And they came in with, with these expectations and now they're higher than what they thought, even though their earnings were lower. In fact, we just saw the chart, guys. You can't make this stuff up. I, I, and I'm not kidding you. The news right now is saying they're celebrating the market. Oh, uh, corporate earnings are above expectations. This company is coming in, we're coming in way above expectation. And it's just like, but it's negative 7%. Like, that's awful. From a year ago, guys, look at this. Q2 from a year ago, it was 3%. That's from almost four. To go from four to seven is almost 11% change. That's like saying, you should buy tickets at the Jazz, even though we lost 10 more games or 15 more games this year than we did last year. And by the way, because of that, you should pay a premium. Well, when you look at the S&P 500, that is the story it's telling, is people are buying this. They're not buying this chart. They're buying the news. They're buying what, this, what stock reports are coming out that we're outbeating expectations. And so they're placing bets on a vehicle that earnings are actually dropping on. And I just don't see how this works, guys. I don't see how you can have earnings continue to drop and you're placing bets higher in a stock and that continues. It's it's exactly what I showed you on the Warren Buffett indicators, how you calculate value in a stock. You look at earnings and then you divide it by like its past earnings and, and then you compare it to everything else. So it's like, what's total market cap? right? They call it actually a PE ratio with the stock. But like, what's its PE ratio? And if the PE ratio is way overcooked, it's not a stock that I'm that I'm interested in buying. So here's the, here are the takeaways. And I'm just going to start nailing you guys with some of the data points. And then we'll go through one more chart and we'll wrap this thing up. 
Um, earnings, uh, what do I want to talk about expectations? So the earnings scorecard for Q2 2023 was 80% of S&P 500 companies. Uh, they reported a positive EPS surprise. Now, an EPS surprise is exactly what we were talking about. In fact, the definition, let me, let me explain this definition to you guys. So an earnings surprise occurs when a company's reported quarterly or annual profits are above or below analyst expectations. So they have their analysts crunch numbers. These guys are all smoking the same crack and they come in with these expectations. The companies far exceed the expectations. We call that a surprise. Well, guess what? 80% of the S&P 500 companies have reported positive EPS surprises and 63% have reported positive revenue surprises. So what are we seeing? Of the EPS, 80% are surprised. Of that, 63% is positive. The other, what would that be? 17% is negative. So great. Everyone was doing the jazz analogy. Everyone set their expectation insanely low and we're doing better. But where are we with earnings? Earnings are lower year over year. Earnings decline, bended, so blended earnings over all this, all these markets declined for Q2, as we, we talked about, 7.1%, making the largest decline since Q2 of 2020. This is the largest decline since Q2 of 2020, guys. That's three years spread. So this is the, the worst we've had it in earnings. How, I don't have to even show you, you guys know this. Look up the S&P 500 after we're done with this and tell me how this makes any sense. Also the VIX, in fact, I, ah, I wish I had more time for this. The two things, here's your homework. For those who are watching, listening, we'll come back to this. You know, if you watch this even a week from now, I think this is relevant. Go look at the S&P 500 price. Go look at the VIX. Here are the things I'd be looking at. If earnings are an all-time low compared to 2020, look at the price of the S&P 500. At Q2 2020, look at the price now and ask yourself, how does this make sense? Just ask yourself that. Then go to the VIX. because The VIX is a volatility indicator. It shows when the market is highly volatile or not, highly complacent. When the market is typically complacent or the VIX number, VIX, by the way, for those of you new at this, when the VIX number is relatively low, that means the market is complacent. It means that everyone's feeling good about things again for some reason. <laughs> I say for some reason in this case, sometimes there's good reasons, but everyone's feeling good. And so what happens is stocks climb because people are holding, right? It's this holdal mentality that keeps uh, prices climbing. When the VIX goes really high, that means it's really volatile. And that typically only happens, uh, and what happens in the market is people start pulling their cash out and we start seeing major swings in the market and people are moving assets around, which causes, uh, you know, maybe they're moving from the stock market to bonds or they're moving from bonds to property or something else, right? Well, I've got some theories on why I think this is happening and I don't think it's a, uh, sustainable, but, and, and I think it will shift. Investors, as we've talked about in some past webinars, investors have pulled out by almost 70% in the real estate market. That's just a fact. So uh, sophisticated investors who normally invest in property, we've seen a 70, and it's probably even higher now, but the latest data shows 70% drop year over year. So like investors aren't interested in property right now or real estate. Why? Because the numbers don't work out, interest rates. So now there's all these people who've got cash or money that they're typically putting into real estate and they're feeling like I got to put it in something. So what do they do? They put it in these growth stocks, Google, Microsoft, you know, the top seven. And what happened, and maybe they're placing their bets on AI or some, you know, radical technology thing that's going to happen in the next year. But generally speaking, this is what's happening. Most of the money has gone into the top seven stocks. Those top seven stocks are what's propping up the entire S&P 500. In fact, they're like the only profitable stocks. They're the only stocks, the weight of their profitability is what's keeping the S&P 500 uh, propped up. Whereas you look at the other you know, 493 stocks, and if you weight that, it's crap. I wouldn't, I, 
if you had your money in those 400, like equally blended 493 stocks in the S&P 500, I, I don't even think you'd have a positive return right now. But the top seven are carrying all the weight. And so my theory, and I think I'm, I'm like spot on on this, the reason that the market is high is one, yes, there is this complacency. There's this kind of manipul rug pull manipulation happening with the news. You know, big stakeholders that obviously don't want to see the market drop there. They're smoking the stuff and telling the story, right? But on the other side, you have these investors who are used to putting money in, the, in real estate. And you have two options right now. You can put it in the stock market, which is way more sexy. Or you can put it in bonds and get like 5%. So what do you think is happening? Well, I think there's a blend of it happening. Uh, people definitely are gravitating towards bonds more than they ever have. People are putting money into CDs, money market accounts, which essentially is money going into bonds. And, uh, and they're putting it in the stock market. And so I think that's why we're seeing things as overbought or as overvalued as we are seeing uh, is frankly, there's nowhere else to put the money. And so people are kind of hoping the market up. Do I think... We're going to wrap this up, but do I think that the market uh, could go higher? This, this is an interesting theory. Uh, the, the answer is yes, actually. I, I think the, the S&P 500 as a whole could go up. I think there's actually, there's even more cash on the sidelines. And if FOMO hits, you're going to have that last hurrah and that last peak uh, that that kind of runs up before sanity hits and people look at the data and they look at the numbers and go, wow, this makes no sense. I bought at the all-time high. There's no upside to this. So I think there, there will be more complacency. There's the potential uh, for you know not a market scare. And so cash will keep going into these markets. They'll keep going into the uh, securities. Is there a, a likelihood that we're there? and that this is it, and we're probably not gonna see much more growth. Uh, yes, if we can keep inflation low and printing low. So if we can keep inflation coming down and the government stops stimulating everything and throwing extra cash into, into the economy, then we're not gonna have all this fluff. Uh, I have another piece of this that, I actually have some charts and some ways that I value the markets that show this, but I actually don't think most inflation is done. Uh, I think that it's very likely that we'll go through another wave. And so, it, you know, hold on. If you didn't like this last roller coaster, I think we're going, I think the possibility of us going through another inflationary wave is coming. And the reason is, is of this, the, it, how do you get values to start matching up? How do you get GDP to start matching uh, or dropping? Well, we really need GDP to go up, but how do you get GDP to go up to bring the value of the stock price down? And it's really, we've got to have more inflation. Uh, it's either that or the cash is, has to find better places to sit. And frankly, there's just so much cash out there that it's going to sit somewhere, even if it's overvalued. I think people value stocks above the dollar in a lot of cases. And the market, I think, is showing that. The market's showing people value their stock in a company over their value in the dollar. Meaning like if the dollar went to crap, they trust Google and its brand to you know, work in whatever currency over working in the dollar. Uh, unless we get more strength in the dollar in some way, and the you know, there's a lot of news about the BRICS and these emerging currencies uh, that are happening uh, out of the country and, and possibly this alternative reserve currency, global reserve currency that uh, we're hearing a lot about. Unless that goes away and we get more dollar strength, my prediction is we probably will go through another uh, period of inflation. I just don't see how we avoid it. But anyways, until then, you've got a lot of homework to do. Check out the S&P 500, right? That's your uh, one of your assignments. Check out the VIX and then make your trades uh, based on timing, right? And here, here are some factors to consider before we end. One, if your strategy is long-term, you may 
not care about this. You may not care that it's overbought, right? If your strategy is retirement 10, 20, 30 years from now, it's like the, the play is long-term anyway. So you may be shifting what you invest in, but you may stay in the market. If you're short-term and you're like, I need to be out of the market. I, I like what I have in my account right now and I need it to be there a year from now. You might look at like locking it up into something more secure, right? Putting it into a bond. Gosh, I, I opened up an, a broker account so I opened up my own trading account at this brokerage and just my cash sitting there gets over five and a half percent or four and a half percent. So you don't even have to get in a money market account or a CD to get four and a half percent. There are literally these brokerages. You could just plant your money. I've got two and a half million dollars of insurance protection on my account and I don't pay for that. It just comes with it. And I'm getting four and a half percent. So do a little research. There are tons of places that are doing this just for cash holdings. Um, and it's not keeping up with true inflation, but it's at least keeping up with the inflation reported right now. All right, guys, that's wrapping things up. Thanks for being on. Thanks for your participation. Let me see if there's any comments. All right, we must have done a good job today going through comments. Um, same time, same place next week. I'm not sure what we're going to be covering next week. We're not going into the real estate side, but um, we will be... I'll be likely hitting points throughout the week and then doing a summation uh, on this podcast. So look forward to having your participation next week. If you guys have any thoughts, comments, things you'd like to hear about on my YouTube channel, make sure that you put those in the comment section. For whatever reason, it was closed and locked up. I've just opened that back up. So you can put your comments in there. If you've got a market or a, an issue or something you're dealing with that you want to have me look at, uh, I, I actually read through all the comments and I take you guys' feedback to create these. So thanks for your participation. Thanks for helping me out with that. We'll see you here, same time, same place next week. Thanks so much.